Now, hope um, in itself is an interesting thing. Um, it's quite a broad concept. Um, even if we looked at it just from the perspective of someone who wasn't a Bible believer, um, there was a lot to talk about. Hope is a very powerful thing, and it can be very beneficial for one's well-being. And to take a quote, not a scriptural quote, but from a, uh, a leading psychological publication called Psychology Today, based in New York, and I quote, If I could find a way to package and dispense hope, I would have a pill more powerful than any antidepressant on the market. Hope is often the only thing between man and the abyss. As long as a patient or individual or victim has hope, they can recover or overcome anything. So even those who don't believe in the Bible admit that hope is a very powerful tool or thing. To want something to happen to be true and usually have a good reason to think uh, that it might. Okay, so with that as a context then, what are some of the things we might hope for? Some of the things, it's just an example we've touched on, there's, there's lots of things, the point is lots of things that people might hope for and things that we might look forward to or think we might want to happen. But the important thing is that none of those are contained in the hope in the Bible. Okay, these are all, um, we've had kingdom and stance, that's great, we'll be going there in a minute, but most of the things that people hope for are not contained in the Bible. It's not the hope that we're talking about. They're things we hope for now, and that's fine, and some of them, there's nothing wrong with them per se, but they're not contained um, in the Bible. But as followers of Christ, or we group ourselves as Christadelphians, uh, we believe the Bible gives us all the instruction we need. Everything that's in it, we need to know is within it. Um, and an example we can take is up on the screen from 2 Timothy 3. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, literally means God breathed, uh, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New, uh, not just taking sections of it, the whole Bible uh, is God-breathed. God caused it to be written um, by holy men uh, in days gone past. And so we strive to base our lives completely on what's contained in it. It gives us instruction on what we should do and when we should do it. And so it's from the Bible then that we're going to talk further um, about hope. But uh, the, the Bible talks about hope in lots of different ways, lots of different contexts, extremely broad. Um, and here are just a few examples on the screen. So it talks of the hope of righteousness. That's in Galatians 5. It talks of the hope of glory in Colossians 1. The hope, the hope of salvation in 1 Thessalonians 5. And the hope of eternal life in Titus 3. But if you've got your Bibles on your laps, you want to turn up, um, we're going to look at a couple of uh, passages. So most will be on the screen, but we'll do a bit of uh, thumbing of the Bible. So uh, Ephesians 4, Ephesians in the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians 4 then, and we're going to uh, read the first six verses. So Apostle Paul speaking. Uh, I therefore, Ephesians 4 verse 1, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So verse 4 then, we have this interesting dichotomy because it says there is one hope. So we've already touched on a few examples, there are many more, but the Bible's saying there is actually one hope. So the important bit to take from here is that all of the different aspects of hope through the Bible, and some we'll look at tonight, are all bound in one hope. They're all talking about the same thing. Okay, and that's an important point because we could get lost on, oh, this is talking about this, this is talking about this, they're all one in the same. Uh, also then, uh, just look at another quote from the uh, Apostle Paul speaking. Acts is back uh, a few pages in Acts 28, still in the New Testament. 28, Acts 28 verse 20. For this cause therefore have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bowed with this chain. So again, another example of hope, um, but he's talking now, it's called it the hope of Israel. 
and that Paul is bound with um, these chains. And so the hope of Israel is also the same hope that we've been looking at, and it's also the same hope that's contained, as, as Joseph said, uh, about God's kingdom here on earth. So we might ask then, well, what's, um, what's his kingdom going to be like that we're told we should hope for? You know, we've been looking um, at different hopes, but the kingdom is perhaps one, a big one that we can explore and bring to life um, in, some, in some moments this evening together. So we're going to look at um, seven aspects of the kingdom. What we're going to do is, is look at the world in which we live now and look at uh, what the Bible says is going to be different and therefore builds up part of this hope, the same hope the Apostle Paul had that got him through his difficult times and, and is the same hope that we can, we can share now. So the first thing uh, we can look at is war. Um, looked at a piece of research, and it's difficult to fully say, but looking back through time and in the thousands of years, whatever your view of history is, but in the last thousand years, I think it was five or six thousand years, something like about 200 years, they don't think there's been a, a war on the air. So basically, man has been warring ever since Cain and Abel. Um, you know, two Old Testament characters. So we can look at uh, World War I, you know, vast numbers of people that were, were killed, World War II the same. Uh, the Syrian war, which is really still going on, has been going on for a long time, perhaps not in our news so much now, uh, and, and huge numbers of, of death toll there. Um, and the Russo-Ukrainian war, which is coming to a head in the last month, but again has been really going on since Crimea and, and the incidents that were there. Um, and these stats, I should say, are taken from the United Nations. There's a bit of discrepancy, a few hundred here and there, but, but um, generally the range of 13 to 14,000 is agreed on. But we'd agree it's not uh, a good picture. It's certainly not a hope. I don't think anyone would hope for war. But uh, the point is that there's war in the world. What does the Bible then say as an antithesis or answer to this? And, and say most of the quotes I'll put up on the screen. Um, but, but we read in Micah 4, verse 3. It's the end of the Old Testament, towards the end of the Old Testament. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. And so we can see in these beautiful words, really, that there will be a time when the things of war, the mechanics of war, the mechanism of war, will be taken uh, and changed and put into a use of agriculture. And why is that important? I think something we can also pick up from that is that, that food production, whilst a lot of us are distanced from it now, uh, it is essential to life. We, we need to eat to survive, we need to drink and eat food. And so scripture is drawing our minds to say actually the war, that ultimately is the opposite of that, is death. No, you're going to focus on life and sustaining life as well. Now, um, this is something you've probably seen before. Um, this is uh, outside of the United Nations, and it's an interesting statue. You can probably understand, I'm sure, what it's um, depicting about beating those weapons of war into something far more useful for agriculture. Um, I think what's also more interesting, you'll know who donated this. USSR in 1959, the irony now, and this is sat outside the United Nations, who's condemning their, um, their actions. But even, even man in their own vision accepts that this is something the scripture teaches of, and really they would like as a whole, um, but until, until the Lord Jesus returns, this won't be a reality, but therefore it's something that we can hope for. Um, not a nice topic either, but um, we can look at murder. Um, and this one I found quite uh, shocking. Does anyone know uh, the most recent stats is the 2021 fiscal year, uh, how many murders there were in the UK? S 600. Um, and you just think about it statistically for a minute, it shocked me. Um, you know, it's not quite two a day, but that's statistically every day, and we can talk about statistics in a minute. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not an insignificant number. We might think we live in a, a fairly safe and developed country, um, but murder is something that's prevalent in our country, even that we live in. So again, what's, what's the antithesis? What does the Bible talk about in terms of murder and hurt and death? Um, this one's taken from, you can see it good, from Isaiah um, 65. The wolf 
uh, and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord, saith Yahweh. So it's going to be a time where there won't be hurt, there won't be murders, there won't be killing, there won't be uh, death. Now, whatever your view um, on the changes in our climate, man-made or not, how great the effect is, that's not our debate for tonight, um, but the world is changing and some of the things we do clearly do have uh, an effect on the planet around us. Um, since, uh, since 1880s, 1900, towards the end of that century, um, global temperatures increased by almost 1.2 degrees, and that was uh, to 2020 and they're continuing to rise. Um, and global sea levels have increased by up to um, a quarter of a metre, most agree on. Um, we've also seen the last year, we can think of wildfires. Uh, there's one being in the news, looks like it was uh, in the, our country, uh, perhaps started by arsonists, but one recently. Um, and looking at uh, the US Global Change uh, Research Programme, it was actually in 2017, but it's been continuing as a trend since. It said there's been a profound increase uh, in forest fire activity just in recent decades, and the trend is continuing alarmingly. And so we've seen that uh, all in the news in the last year or two. So the world um, is changing, and even if we look at it not from a climate or sea level perspective, uh, we look at what we're doing with plastic use. Uh, and this is something we recognise from, from um, documentaries um, with Attenborough and, and Co and others. You know, plastics become a real problem from our use of it. Um, at least 14 million tonnes of plastic end up in the ocean every year from our use. And it's not only just that, but it's what happens when it breaks down. We don't really know, but we end up with microplastics that are now in our food chain. Uh, they've even been found um, in the polar caps, some of the most remotest parts of our globe. Um, and it's having an effect. Um, so whatever our view again of it, we can see this is, is happening. We are impacting our planet in a negative way. Again... Uh, what's the Bible's response? Um, Ezekiel 36, verse 35, they will say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden being where God created it. It was very good at the beginning. God has promised that it will be like that once more again in his kingdom. Mismanaged uh, politics. You'll recognise the screenshot from a recent when Zelensky was uh, presenting in the UK Parliament. Um, an interesting, um, unprecedented occasion. But whenever we listen a bit on, uh, on the news or the radio or read papers, whatever uh, we take our media form in, how often do we see articles just arguing, really, aren't they? Debating about who said what to who and what would happen and what hasn't happened and so on and so forth. Um, and in reality, a lot of it is just lies, isn't it? Um, a, a quote attributed to, to uh, Disraeli initially, um, which I quite like, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and the statistics. And how often do we see that in Parliament, that they, they'll come out with some, ah, well, you're wrong, it's because of this, this and this. But it's just how you skew the data. You can get data to say what you want. Um, and so this is, this is the world in which we live. Um, we, we have politicians who, again, you listen to them answering a question, can talk eloquently for 15 and 20 minutes, and you get to the end, you realise they've said absolutely nothing. Um, and even to look at our own, except we're not into politics, I'm not taking sides, but just what we've got before us now, um, our incumbent Prime Minister has been found wanting many times recently, um, be it lockdown parties or cronyism and so on and so forth. The, the, the point is, politics on any, whatever side it's in um, is fundamentally flawed. Again, we look at the Bible, what's the hope of this, this kingdom talked about in the Bible? Uh, many examples, we'll just take one from Psalm 72. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, that which is right, that which is just. Uh, and in his days shall the righteous flourish, abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the end of the earth. So talking about this global kingdom that will come, will be uh, judged by the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, and it will be righteous judgment. And many other passages say we can look at, be it Malachi 2 verse 6, um, the law of truth will be in his mouth, iniquity will not be found in his lips, and he will walk in peace and equity, equity, fairness. Um, so a different rule. Um, and, and what about fear? Um, Brother Sam mentioned it in his, um, sorry, one of the brothers this morning mentioned it in their prayers. 
uh, about men's hearts failing for fear, um, which is a quote from Luke 21, verse 26. And whatever it is, be it the wars and the effect they may or may not have on us, be it spiralling inflation. And we're all prone to fear, aren't we? That things are, uh, are going to change, things are changing and rapidly, and they can understandably make us worry. Um, we wouldn't be human, perhaps we might say, if we don't worry. Um, but the fear is something that, that is becoming more prevalent. Again, what does the Bible uh, um, talk about? What he touched on peace, but uh, this quote from, from Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, um, and joy. Again, sadness, pain, and uh, tears. Uh, you probably heard the quote, it is impossible to be sure of anything but death and taxes. Um, uh, later quoted by Defoe um, uh, and others, but actually it was uh, Christopher Bullock in 1716. But the point is um, that in life there isn't much that we can be sure of, um, but uh, certainly death uh, is one that we can be. We'll come on to that in a second. Um, but it's also true in the interim then, whatever state we find ourselves, uh, we all suffer pain uh, in different ways and sadness comes to us again in different ways, but it's something that we all share as an experience. What does the Bible say about its hope? Revelation 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any pain, for the former things are passed away. That is, the former things are gone. And this is a different time that we are talking about. This is a step change in the world. I said, really, we've touched on it in the, par in the previous point, but um, mortality, again, from that quote, something that happens common to all of us. Uh, we all will die if Christ remains away uh, and will continue to do so. And we might ask, well, why is that? That's not fair. Well, um, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. It's quite simply that. Death passes upon all men, for that all have sinned, to quote another uh, quote from Romans. And in our lives, we all do things that are contrary to God. We all do things that are contrary to the divine way of doing things. And therefore, death has passed upon all men. But that quote is beautiful because there's another part of it in Romans 6, but it says, but the gift of God, and notice a gift, something we can't earn, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I mean, look at other passages like uh, Isaiah 40, but they... That wait upon Yahweh, the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, walk and not uh, faint. So I appreciate us a, a whistle through seven different items. I'll put them up in a table form if you prefer to take your data that way. Um, but just to look at the comparisons of those seven points with where we live now, uh, the, the future hope, uh, part of the hope that the Bible talks about and some references to support it. Again, you might then say, well, okay, interesting, but what do we do with that information? What should we do? Now we're starting to get an understanding of the Bible hope. Well, firstly, we need to understand it fully. So I can't tell you everything in the time a lot as I've said. So we need to study and look at the word for ourselves to understand the bigger picture of this hope. For our hope must be built upon the word of God, to quote Romans 15 verse 4 uh, that we had as part of our introductory reading. When we hear then this word, we should have faith. That's in Romans 10, verse 17. And it is then that this faith that provides that basis for hope. Just uh, Hebrews 11, uh, if you want to stand up in your Bible, it's a well-known verse, but we have these uh, items brought together, these concepts brought together. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance, the ground, or confidence, or foundation uh, of things hoped for the evidence of things that are not seen. So this, this hope uh, and faith are intertwined. We're also told in Romans 8, verse 24, that we are saved by hope. Hope is essential to our saving and salvation. Without hope, we can't hope to be saved, to, to mix my words. But, that, but hope is a critical part of being saved. And again, in our introductory reading in Romans um, 15 and verse 13, the end of what Brother Sam 
uh, read, we read that God himself is a God of hope. We're starting to understand the importance of hope as a concept, that God himself is a God of hope. And when we understand and start to embrace this hope then, how should it make us feel? How should it make us behave now while we're waiting for said hope? Well, there's a number of um, examples. Again, just put three up uh, for brevity, but um, it should make us rejoice. Romans 5 verse 2, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 12 verse 12, rejoice in hope. Hebrews 3 verse 6, hold fast the rejoicing of the hope affirmed to the end. And we could go on to talk about endurance and so on and so forth, but that's uh, time doesn't allow. But I just want to finish um, really on, on, on this slide and go back to, to where we, we started and then conclude. Because we looked at the definition of hope, we had some good answers uh, from the audience, and, and to take the dictionary definition, um, you can see I've underlined the important parts that we didn't touch on at the beginning, but... Hope is to want something to happen, to be true, and usually have good reason to think that it might. And this is where hope as a concept in the world now, and the hope as a concept of the Bible, and why I just called the title of the talk Hope, um, is because actually hope is a very different thing to what we understand hope to be now, if we understand this. So um, let's look together, final reference at Hebrews 6, because this... Um, is a really important point that I want to leave with you. So reading um, from Hebrews 6 and some verses between 13 uh, and 19. Hebrews uh, 6, then verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, we've looked at the, the, the promise, this hope of Israel, Abraham being one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Israel. When God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. Jumping to verse 17, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise their immutability, old word perhaps, but something that can't be changed, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us, which hope, verse 19, we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast. Elsewhere translated sure and certain by other versions. And so the Bible hope is, is not a hope of a, a want to think or a might. And that's not the hope we're talking about. This is a certain hope. It's sure. It will happen. And therefore, it can provide an anchor for our souls. And what we need to do is decide which part we'll play. Do we want to know more of this hope? Do we want to include it? We can talk about baptism and taking on and being the spirit uh, in the seed of Abraham and so on and so forth. But just as a, as a concept, which hope do you want? Do you want a hope that's something that might, we think, probably going to happen? Or do you want a hope that is sure and certain? Not only that but it can provide an anchor for our souls, which we need more than ever in the challenging world in which we live. Thank you for listening.